I'm Bob Whitmarsh. I'm the AT director at the Cradle of Texas chapter here in Missouri County. And this is going to be our virtual field session to Flohanna Prairie and Fallas Island Prairie. And I'm here right now with Mike Lane. He works, or he is Texas Conservation Partners. He finds, evaluates, negotiates his purchase for nonprofit organizations. So this prairie right here belongs now to the Galveston Bay Foundation. And we're fortunate to be here with Mike. He was instrumental in finding the prairie, negotiating the, the purchase. Dr. David Rosen's Lee College has done an evaluation. We'll hear about what we found and, and why. And Dr. Rosen's consideration, this is a pristine Texas Gulf Coastal Prairie. So it's, it's very comparable to the Nash Prairie, if any of you have been there or heard of that. And so we're really happy to have it. Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about the property, the size of it, and whatnot. Okay, this, uh, this is the Flohanna Prairie. Um, I've worked on this for about uh, three years. Galveston Bay Foundation's been working on it for close to six. Basically, uh, it was identified through aerial photography and uh, they came out and discovered that this was one of the most pristine prairies in the state of Texas. The money to acquire the tract came from the Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Conservation Commission through the North American Wetlands Conservation Act. We've acquired about 114 acres, which is a very large remnant for a native prairie. Um, there are probably over 200 native species here. Dr. David Rosen is working on a complete flora of the entire property. Today we'll just take a quick look at uh, what's out here. These, pr these prairie remnants have been saved because they were used as native hay fields, never grazed, never plowed, so they, the soils were not excessively disturbed. Um, now it'll be managed with uh, fire and with uh, periodic haying, and that should keep it in good condition uh, for future generations. I understand the Texas Gulf Coastal Prairie once extended over nine million acres, and I wonder how much of that might still remain. Do you have any idea? Uh, I've heard the figure of less than 1%, yes. but far less than 1%. Yeah. There are some native prairies. Uh, the Nash Prairie is one example. Uh, the Deer Park Prairie in Houston is another example. It's about 50 acres. The Mowatney Prairie, which is which is near the Nash Prairie, is another one. Uh, in in Brazoria County, in this area, and in Harris County and the uh, surrounding areas, there are quite a few native prairies. They're all very distinct. They're all very different. They have a different mix of plants, so they're all very important for conservation. There are also some uh, native rangelands in Matagorda County and others that are in excellent condition and are also basically native prairies. So um, it's something really special. Um, this particular prairie is dominated by eastern gamma grass, which is a, a wetland prairie plant, and that is very unusual because uh, most of the native prairies are not dominated by eastern gamma grass. They may have some eastern gamma grass, but it has lots of other species and lots of wetland species, and that's why we could use wetland money uh, through the North American Wetland Conservation Act to, um, to acquire this. But we also had tremendous donations from uh, individuals and organizations. I can't list them all off the top of my head, but uh, important ones were Cradle of Texas Conservancy, uh, of course, Galveston Bay Foundation, many individual donors. There's uh, tremendous support for my work and for uh, completing the acquisition of the prairie. You mentioned to me before we started that it's very difficult to restore disturbed prairie to the native condition. You want to talk about why the, the depth of the roots and whatnot make it very difficult to, to transfer these things? 
Uh, people have been trying to do that for years and years, basically to take d very degraded prairie uh, pastures that were overgrazed and try to restore them to native prairie. And you can add uh, native species, but the complexity of a prairie like this is incredible. Yeah. There's over 200 native species that comprise this prairie. And we really don't understand all of their relationships, the ecology of these prairies, and how to restore them. It, it might take a generation. So it's very important to save the ones you can. And that's also important because these can be a source of seeds and research and uh, plant material to uh, be used to, to restore other prairies. Nearby is the Brazoria National Wildlife Refuge with extensive areas of native, native prairie, but they're not in the condition of this prairie. And the seed source from here can be used to help restore some of the plants that are missing from that prairie. Um, so this will be a tremendous resource over the coming years for restoration of other native prairies. Well, let's take a look around and see what we can see. We'll, we'll walk a bit and let, let the camera scan and see what's out here. It looks like a very nice meadow to me, <laughs> but I don't recognize all of the individual plants and I'm sure we'll, we'll look, look, try to look for some of those native plants and, and see what we can see. Uh, the prairie was mowed just before we purchased it, hayed, which is a good thing. It needs to be periodically hayed, um, baled, and they remove the, remove the hay bales from the prairie. But even in, that was only two months ago, and you, or, or two and a half months ago, and you can see how quickly the uh, prairie immediately starts growing back from the root system. And, you know, it's about this tall now, but in a couple months it'll be standing up belly high here. What's this one? So you mentioned we were here in August taking a look at this prairie, and there's not many flowers. We've seen a couple, seen a few, saw milkweed that's coming out, saw a couple other things, but how would you describe the prairie as you go through the seasons? Is it very much different in spring and fall and summer and winter? Yes, it's constantly changing uh -huh. and I'm not an expert botanist, but the botanist will tell you there's some plants that are gonna bloom in, in, the, in the fall. There's a lot of species that are gonna bloom in the spring and even all summer long. The grasses, I think, are blooming here right now, uh, in some of the grasses. So it's constantly changing. I would guess that spring would probably be the most, the prettiest time because mm -hmm. of all the flowers. Mm -hmm. Well, the green looks nice right now, though. It's really nice. Yeah. We've had enough rain, I guess. Yes, there's been, plenty of, there's been plenty of rain through the summer. We've been joined by Susan Conaty, a master naturalist who's worked at the Nash Prairie for years and years, I guess a long time. She's very knowledgeable about the plants, and even though they're not in good blooming condition right now, she's guaranteed she can identify everything here. <laughs> well, okay, maybe almost everything here, because some of the non-natives she won't know, that's all right. So anyway, it's a good time to have her. She's going to help us identify some things, so we're going to walk around again and try to get some close-ups and let her tell us what they are. This is Zamsonia, Ohio Blue Star. Uh, you really only find this in a, in a good prairie. You're not really going to find it too much on the uh, side of the road or in a ditch or a grazed pasture, you're gonna find it in a prairie. So that's a really good indicator of this, the quality of this prairie here. One of the milkweeds out here, uh, Linaris, and uh, you can tell that by these opposite leaves on here. And there's two of them going opposite. There's two here and two here. Uh, uh, passion vine incarnata, uh, the native passion vine, the Gulf Ret uh, larval food is out here. It's, you can see it everywhere. What what amazes me out here is all the different sedges and rushes in just a little bit of a small section here. You have different, you can see them here, here's some. Here's another milkweed, uh, another passion vine, some more rushes and sedges, 
clumps of, I assume this is, uh, let's see, I think this is a clump of switchgrass. Uh, and you can see, as you look out here, you can see all the different textures. And each, each of those different textures is different species of uh, grass or some other forbs. Oh, I see another patch of Ansonia over there. It's just, it's just gorgeous. It's an incredible place. This is a, a green milkweed. It's the most common milkweed in this area. We call it green milkweed. It's veritas, As Asclepius veritas, the one in uh, more of the hill country. They call it antelope horns, but this, and they look very similar. The leaf is kind of the same. The flower is very much the same, but there is a difference. Ours is green milkweed here in Brazoria County. Here's a milkweed starting to bloom. It's got a little little flower they're usually bigger than that but that's getting started there are a few invasive uh, non-native species out here but there are very few and 99.999% um, of the biomass out here is all native plants by I would guess by uh, species count it'd be less than 1% of uh, non-native species this is one of the uh, invasive species here the vasi grass but even though it has this vasi grass in, in it, and it's, it's around here where it's been disturbed and hayed a lot, and maybe where the trucks have come in to get the hay out, it's still so much good stuff in here that it's almost, it's not, it's not that relevant. It's, it's, it's somehow all of the native uh, species have persisted even with this vasi grass in here. This is the Which one is poster that? child <laughs> of uh, the prairies here in Brazoria County, uh, the Texas coneflower. This is just shooting up its flower stalk. It gets, it'll, they can get high above my head. Uh, looks like a black-eyed Susan on steroids. And it is a, it is a, even though the common name is coneflower, it is not an echinacea. It's a rudbeckia. It's rudbeckia texanus. And sometimes the uh, common name is shiny leaf coneflower and you can see it's a smooth, almost leathery type leaf on the end of it. So, uh, likes it a little wet. It, you don't find this north of here too much. So it's endemic to this part of Texas and these prairies. This is eastern gamma grass, and you can see the anthers uh, sticking out on the seed head here, and watch this. There's the pollen, tons of pollen coming yeah. off of it. This prairie has tons. The first time we came by here, the east, and it was in, and it was taller. I guess it was in the fall. The eastern gamma grass is everywhere. Mm -hmm. It's the most eastern gamma grass I've ever seen until yesterday, <laughs> the other day when I was with Mike. We had another piece of property, but mm -hmm. that's another story. <laughs> but this is incredible amount of eastern gamma grass. The Nash Prairie only has about three or four big clumps of. Uh, eastern gamma grass. This is almost like an eastern gamma grass prairie. Um, so this is it. It's a very robust looking grass. But one way, like right now when it's, things aren't really in bloom, one way you can kind of, if you're kind of just starting out, eastern gamma grass's root comes up off the ground like this. So this is its root. So if you have a, cl these, these clumps of eastern gamma grass can look like switchgrass clumps. But if you look down here at where it's coming out and you see this root, this kind of root coming out like that, then you know that's eastern gamma grass. That's one of the easiest ways to tell if you're just starting out, do you have a clump of eastern or a clump of switchgrass? Because they kind of grow in the same, switchgrass likes it down here a little wetter, eastern gamma grass likes it a little wetter. They kind of have the, in the prairie, the switchgrass and the eastern gamma grass has the bigger blade than the little blue and the big blue. So that's one I didn't find. Mark, that's for us novices who aren't experts. <laughs> Here's another. See, and and uh, and definitely once it starts blooming, this is this is very unique. Uh, the seed coming, the seed stalk coming up, looks like a miniature corn. Very different than switchgrass. Switchgrass is a panicum that has a has more like a Christmas tree. In fact, you can get, you can confuse switchgrass with Johnson grass. 
This is one of my favorites, Clematis. And I believe that the, uh, it decided it's pitcher eye. But not, oh, the, the baby grasshopper. Oh, where? See him on the tip? Oh, I see him. <laughs> He's so cute. Isn't that gorgeous? This this is found all over this prairie. Clematis is everywhere. Look at this. Clematis yeah, all over the place. Clematis and you, and you have Amazonia. the seed you have the seed heads developing. Oh yeah, there's a seed head. These the are seed, so cool. Seed heads on all of it. That's right the there. seeds of the clematis. Isn't that beautiful? And it will flatten out even more, I think. This little disc like. This is cool. This is ironweed. It likes a little wet Missouri ironweed. It's gonna it's gonna get higher for the fall, and in in places like at the Nash where it was just burned a year ago, it's already blooming there and it's already about this tall. But this will still come up some more in the bloom before winter. You have the uh, Bapti Baptis Baptisia, Baptisia, false wild indigo. It's a pea plant in the. Um, spring it has a yellow pea flower on it this is the erect one i'm sure they have the in fact i saw the plant list they do they have the nodding one that has the pea plant goes down and is a different color yellow so i'm sure they have both of them on this prairie here's some fimbri styluses here and these are gorgeous it's not a grass it's it's not a forb it's it's grass-like. <laughs> so I guess as a novice is what I'd say, is you start to pay attention to um, the silhouette of a plant, mm -hmm. you know, at first. And when you look out over a pasture or the side of the road, eventually you're able to spot eastern damagrass in the ditch. Mm -hmm. You might see the stalk coming up or you see a big clump of grass that's bigger than anything else you see. And uh, and so you start examining those things like this. I know this is Texas coneflower. Like I said, the leaf, I can already tell that by the leaf. There's also rosin weed out here, which the leaf at first looks similar, but the rosin weed leaf is rough. So right there, you, that's one indication that it's something other than if you have a rough leaf, it's not rosin weed. And these rosin weeds and Texas coneflowers, those are some of the the bigger leaves that you're going to see on these prairies down here in, in Brazoria County. So that it has Indian plantain, rosin weed, uh, American false aloe. And so those leaves are some of the biggest ones. So it's more than likely it's going to be one of those four plants. And so once you learn the leaf, you can tell it before it flowers when it's in the prairie. This is sensitive, down here they call them sensitive briars, uh, and they call them sensitive briars because when you touch the leaf it closes, closes up, it's real close, and then, and, and uh, I don't know what the species are out here, they're in this county I think there's two, two yellow ones and there's two pink ones. What's so unique about this prairie? And the prairies that we have here, uh, the, the ones that are these remnant hay meadows like the Nash and the Milwaukee, Deer Park Prairie, Follett's Island, which is in a uh, hay meadow, but it's a unique prairie, and uh, Flohanna Prairie, is that every one of them has some species on it that's not on the other one. And yet we're in a 50 mile radius of them all. Uh, Deer Park has the snowy orchid, uh, Nash Prairie has Buttonbush Flat Sedge. Uh, the Milwaukee Prairie is a Sylvanius Drop Seed Prairie that has more Sylvanius Drop Seed on it than the Sylvanius Drop Seed in North Texas has on it, according to Kirsty Harms. Uh, the Strand Prairie is just a unique, I don't even know if anybody's even heard of a Strand Prairie very often. It's just unique. It only happens on the, on the coast line. And, uh, and who knows what David Rosen will find out that's here that's not on those other other prairies so uh, it's incredible that we have now we have these five prairies that each one of them has plants on it that are not on the other one within a 50 mile radius and Nash and Watney are only 10 miles apart and so 
it's it's quite incredible that we <laughs> Okay, we're now on Follis Island. Still have Mike Lane and Susan Conaty with us to help us identify things. The Follis Island is a really interesting ecosystem. From, from here, just to, the, just to my right, is Follis Island Coastal Prairie. It runs all the way to the beach, on, just at the dunes, stops at the dunes, the open beach is different. But from the open beach to the dunes, to prairie and then we have salt marsh to my left and the bay christmas bays up there that way so we want to look at this it's part of the coastal prairie is part of the galveston conservation management area texas parks and wildlife and again mike lane was instrumental in the purchase of the property and he's going to tell us a little bit about it but we're going to look at both the prairie in the salt marsh. This is an incredible prairie. Uh, I think because you've told me, told us before, but because of the salt air, there's really not any invasives here. So uh, th to me, this is just incredible. In fact, right here is uh, the Blue Highway. The Blue Highway is, is basically part of the Strand Prairie. Uh, it's never been seeded or anything. It's one of the best wildflower roads in Texas that nobody knows about till now. And, but right here, I'm just standing, just walked off from the side of the road here. You already have, this is a, the, it's seeded out. This is American blue hearts that's gone to seed. Uh, right here, you have square bud prim, primrose. Right here, you have bluets. Some more fimbri, we saw that at the uh, Flohanna Prairie. Uh, it's just incredible. There's cactus, and, and this isn't even, everything is pretty much bloomed out right now. You don't get a lot in the heat of the summer right here. But, uh, and then, let's see. Oh, I was gonna show you over here. There's a cool plant. Uh, ah, here, here we go. Here's um, red lovegrass, which is a sandy grass down here on the coast. Love grass, red love grass. This is up there, I'll show you more. This is the Indian blanket, Gallardia seed head seeding out. Uh, that highway and all along here is just loaded with uh, Indian blanket in the spring and through the seasons. This vine right here is a uh, climbing milkweed. And so it's not an Asclepius, but here's the flower. And I have pictures of it in bloom, it's that. But this is a uh, what this vine is right here growing and you can see it it's it's all in here it wraps real tight around the grass grasses uh, another uh, pea plant this is false indigo we saw it over there at the um, Flohanna prairie it was green it was just coming up because they just hate it this doesn't really get disturbed i don't even think they mow this road they mow out there but they don't mow this and so this is how it looks at the end of the season It'll break off completely at the bottom of that and that will toss around and then in the spring it will come back up. Uh, where did I see it? I just saw, here we go. This oh. is scarlet pea. 
this is gorgeous blooms all over in the spring just like in big waves it's it's kind of at its not at its peak anymore but it's another little pea plant scarlet pea I have Indian blanket the gallardia and uh, a lot of times the gallardia on this coast here are really red there's very little yellow on them sometimes you'll find them where they're completely red there's no yellow on the tips this is the seed from it see some more of the bluets or bluets and the scarlet pea here this is the this is this is the flower this is the seed head after it's gone to seed it's a little bit sticky but not as sticky as some gallardias so those are the little seeds this one here is just dropped its leaves the petals so it's a little softer and then it goes dry and this is the dry seed this is texas prairie parsley it's gone to seed and this is the seed uh, so that's all in there that's a good, good prairie plant for butterflies black ball tails so this is just an incredible place it is i'm, I'm not seeing any invasives uh, of any sort out here incredible amount of flowering as you can tell compared to what was going on at um Flo Hanna at the moment that doesn't mean good or bad that's just that it, it, it's different and it's different definitely different species of plants out here you can kind of pick the coastal blue stem out right here you can see this greenish um, chalky color blue so you can kind of once you once you notice this you can see it out there you can see little pieces of it kind of like once you see one you see them all I think that's all I can uh, see right here. So I wanted to ask a question. Obviously, this is a unique place. The ecology, the plant life, the bird life, which we haven't looked at yet, but we'll get a little pictures of those later, I hope. It's really important because we don't want every, bit, every acre of it developed. Is that right? <laughs> An understatement. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is... Um, this is uh, this ki th this kind of barrier island habitat in this kind of condition is uncommon, and uh, so we'd like to preserve as much of Follis Island as we can. There's lots of development out here, but we'd like to preserve as many of these areas uh, as we can. And uh, we've added, I believe, nine tracks uh, to the area in the last. Um, three and a half years or so. If you think about it, if you look here, Follis Island kind of goes almost all the way, you can see those houses way down there. This is an incredible amount of stretch of undeveloped beachfront property here. Uh, it's just incredible that, that Mike has been able to save this. And there we are, you can see right over there, there's Dow Chemical, a chemical company. People come down, they go over that bridge and they think, oh, this is the chemical company, all the house, you know. If you just go make a left and come a little further down past the houses, you're in the, one of the most incredible ecosystems in Texas. And it's just, it's just absolutely incredible. I, I always, we come out here, I come out here one or two times a week and uh, to the beach and swimming. And your, your, a lot of your tracks go from bay to beach. Yes, so, um, mo most of them are beach to bay, all the way from Christmas Bay to the beach. Yeah, and uh, they're doing, the dunes has a different set of flowering plants on it and a lot of wildlife on it, and then this and then that. I mean, it's just an incredible place. And I pinch myself so every time I come out here to think, I can't believe <laughs> that I'm on the beach swimming in the water and there's virtually very few people around and not many houses either. Every once in a while somebody will put one up in a weird spot down there that didn't, Mike didn't get. <laughs> Falling down on the job, Mike. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, this is, thank you, Mike, because this is, this is incredible. And uh, same with Flo Hanna for Well, really this, uh, this was, a, again, a partnership of many organizations. Sure. Yeah, I, I get that. Uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Galveston Bay Foundation. We've had individual donors who gave us a lot of money. One, uh, Joe Hudson gave us a quarter million dollars to help buy tracks out here. So there have been a lot of private donations and uh, money through the um, 
the uh, North American Wetlands Conservation Act, money from the BP oil spill, some restoration money to buy additional pieces. So we've, um, we've doubled the size of the preserve, adding nine, nine tracks so far, and we have several others under contract, and we're going to make some more progress in the next year acres? or so. About how many acres? Uh, I'd have to add it up. I think we're getting close to uh, our goal. Um, I think we're, we're getting close to uh, it's over 1,000. We started, when we started the project, uh, when I started working on it, there were 400 and about 430 acres preserved, and I think now we're up to um, close to 1,100 or 1,200, and our goal is about 2,000 acres. So we've got quite a bit more to do. This is the, uh, it's called glasswort. Um, and it holds salt in there. Like there's a, those are two different species of, uh, mm. of uh, What's that? It's very salty. glasswort actually edible. There are many salt tolerant plants that uh, and it's an ad adaptation to salt because because they're succulent plants even that's why the cactus is here too. This is seaside oxide daisy. This, these have already bloomed up they're yellow when they bloom. They, it's a sweet herb. Sweet herb and, it's sweet and this is a little bit succulent too. The leaves are that's ad an adaptation to deal with salt because they don't transpire much water through them. Smooth core grass is all this tall grass here. In the east coast they call it oyster grass. It's uh, one of the few emergent vegetation plants that grows in the salt water. This is the stickless or salt grass. It's got very angular, can you see that? Very, very angular parallel leaves on it. Uh, another salt grass. You can see it all through here. That'd be a good picture of it, right in there. It's very distinct. The stickless spicata. And you can see all the potholes. Right now, the tide's real low, so the so the potholes are are drying up but uh, when tides are a little higher it just just the water dispersed throughout this marsh here's a do you remember the name of this one Susan I, I think it's Mananthacloa I think yeah. or shore grass I guess shore is grass. one one right. common name yeah shore grass another salt tolerant gr grass there aren't very many of them There's a willet. Oh, this is Gallardia. This is just the Gallardia fire wheel. Oh, that's Or anything one. like it. There's, There's some that are really red. Oh, yeah. I was ta talking about the ones that some down here on the beach and even in Galveston. There are almost no yellow tips on them. Look at this. This is gorgeous. Just this expanse. And this is the way this, even even more abundant in the spring, is the way this whole road looks. And the dunes are just loaded with wildflowers. And here we are in what? Middle of August. And it's still. still and it was mowed about a month ago. Best wildflower road in Texas. Better than the blue bonnet country. It is. It is. There's no blue bonnets here. I know. But it's loaded with Indian paintbrushes. Yeah, yeah. Just the, these dunes are just red with them. Showy yellow evening primrose. Can you see it? Yeah. Looks like a a yellow buttercup. Pink buttercup. Or that's lemon bee balm or spotted bee balm. That one right there. And it's it's, all seeded, it's out. seeded out and there's a patch of it over here tons of it and that's it going to seed on this see that patch over there with all the brown seed heads and all of all of this the look like the dried up tumbleweeds that was all uh, indigo false wild indigo that was in bloom which is a yellow piece 
flower too. So you can see. It's not an annual, is it? No, it's no, perennial. it's a perennial. But it In dies fact, on top. It dies back on top. In fact, that's what that's what's so incredible. This is all. All of these things here are perennials. So, like I said, they just mowed that a month ago, and it's already coming back and blooming again. Uh, that's almost, that's it's, it's dominated by perennials. Yeah, it's, it's a perennial garden bed. There's very few annuals in here. This this is a rain lily. And they only bloom, shoot up when they're, when it, after a rain. And these are the seeds. The little black flat seeds are right in here. And it, and it, it just, just comes out of the ground. There isn't even any basil leaf. And so this that's what the flower looks like. Uh, by the way, this is a great book for this road in particular. Uh, just about everything. I see I have things marked in here and uh, documented when they're blooming and stuff. So this, I recommend this book for Follett's Island or anything along the coast. <coughs> that's the red, the red love grass. This is? Yeah, uh-huh. Here's a better this color look at that that blue with a little tint of red in it this is kind of already kind of drying out seeding out again this is the most incredible incredible wallflower road there is you can just look at all the different vegetation here all the different flowers there that are here and uh, I know that they mowed this about a month ago and it's already reblooming uh, if you, American Blue Hearts is not a flower that you see very often. I know I keep talking about it, but here it is. But this, this road is just loaded with American Blue Hearts. Uh, the Nashbury has American Blue Hearts on it. And I think Deer Park probably does too. And well, Watney, but this road is just loaded. There's, I mean, everywhere you look, there's American Blue Hearts coming up. And this is a prairie plant. You're not going to find it in a grazed pasture. Um, you have different crotons. This is a croton. There's several crotons on the beach here. I've forgotten exactly which one this is, but this is a croton plant. Besides just woolly croton, there's this one. <laughs> See here we have the white top flat sedge, white top sedge. See these all over the road too. There's one seeding. Right here on the side of the road is yellow Indian grass. This is a prairie, one of the four major uh, grasses of the tall grass prairie. So, uh, one thing I love about this road is, is you because it doesn't have any blue bonnets on it, you can tell that the highway department has never seeded it. So it's pretty much, this is a nice little prairie <laughs> that, that just happens to have a road put through it. Mm -hmm. And, but it was, it was con you know, connected to the, to the Strand Prairie over here. This is part of the Strand Prairie that's basically gets mowed. So it gets disturbed every once in a while, and, but it's never been seeded by the highway department. Scarlet pea, the uh, Indian blanket, or firewheel, or gallardia. Not root bristle grass is another native, and uh, and then you can see if you go up the hill here, you can see over to the beach, and the uh, sea oats on the dunes. That's a restoration project here. Mike, you might want to talk about that a little bit. It's just a uh, they brought in sand to restore the dune right there, and it's worked really well. It's really Taken off, like. yeah. It's 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 held. They planted it up. It's really it's, it's looking good. This here is, uh, I think, is trailing wild pea. I, I think that um, you can see this little flower. That's the pea pod. Uh, Purslane, it's not in bloom right now. I have pictures of some of it in bloom. Uh,
Okay, Susan and Mike, I really want to thank you both for being here and showing us the beauty of the Flohanna tall grass prairie and the Follows Island strand prairie. You've taught us a lot. The master naturalists are really going to appreciate this, I'm sure. And they'll probably have some questions for you, so I hope both of you can be, <laughs> be able to answer the questions. They said they'd both be there for the question period. So we're in good shape. And uh, thank you again very, very much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Great fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.